Okay, so good morning and we start the lesson. So today's lesson is actually very simple. So mainly I will actually I updated the lecture notes again. So every time I update so uh, and then we will mainly go through the notes because I want to go a little bit fast. And then one thing that I want to uh, show that I don't know how many of you are working on the problems and exercises. Yes. So uh, here so i don't know have you start working on the problems i usually write yes and i also uh, add some pdf file for sigmas and things like that the questions they're usually harder so but anyway just pick some of them try to see if you can solve and if you don't of course you're always uh, welcome to ask and then uh, probably i will dedicate some session or one session at least every few weeks for exercises. So it is very important if you solve a problem and you don't know how to solve it, mark it. So that in those sessions, when I ask, do you have any questions, you can immediately refer to your marked questions and try to ask them, okay? So that would be more efficient way of doing. But I think for the time being, they actually, they are not that hard. I'm just getting used to the symbols and notations that we are using and the terminology, yes? Okay, so today we want to start the last boring part of matrices, I would say, because there is nothing exciting going on. Uh, we introduced a matrix, so let me switch the view for the time being. So uh, we actually talked about matrices, we introduced them, we talked about when we say two matrices are equal, and then we just described a lot of terminologies depending on which matrix we are going to use. Triangular matrices, I don't know, diagonal matrices. Uh, and something like that. But now these are not useful if we don't have, if, 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 if matrix theory is supposed to be useful, we have to be able to combine them, operate on them. Yes. So this is a, actually a very natural way to start defining operations among matrices. And then if you want to follow, because you know that in mathematics, whenever you start a new branch of mathematics, you do not throw everything away and start from scratch you try to build up the concepts based on what you have already learned so for example first we introduce numbers and then we introduce some operations on numbers for example addition subtraction etc etc we want to do more or less the same thing yes i want for example the first operation that i want to find between two matrices is actually what how should i add them there is no God-given rule for adding matrices. That's just convention. We just introduced that convention of adding matrices. It happens to be a useful way of combining matrices. That's why, I mean, that is the mentality behind your head. You could come up with another definition if you want. Then you would deviate from the matrix, a standard matrix theory, and then you develop your own theory. And if you can sell that theory to people by showing that this is useful, people will like it and will follow it. I mean, that is the mentality behind mathematics. You know, in physics, it's not saying that, okay, you have to admit this one, this is my way. No, you see that it should fit with the universe. Yes, but there is no criterion like that in mathematics. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. No, I mean that not, they don't call it probably matrix theory, but if you, so if you have some, uh, for example, matrix theory itself comes from this idea that in normal numbers, we have the commutativity. So we multiply two numbers, it doesn't matter if you multiply three by four or four by three, the answers are the same. But sometimes it happens that some operations are not commutative. Yes. So in those cases, probably it's a good idea to think of a new structure that respects non-commutativity of some kind of operations. Yes. And then people start probably thinking a little bit about those things. I mean that this is the way that mathematics works. Of course, I am not saying that this is exact deviation from matrix theory, but you can still define your own operations on matrices. Yes. Yeah. But these are the most famous standard ones that have been proven very useful. Okay, and then I want to ask you, okay, because I can show you the definition, but assume that you are a mathematician and you want to define, you want to develop this matrix theory, this matrix algebra, I would say, by define how to add two matrices, okay. So usually, by the way, 
it's not the strangest or the the oddest thing that you, comes to mind you need to probably choose the most natural way to define things so if, if i give you two matrices and i ask you define addition of these two matrices if naturally which one is probably a good idea i give you two matrices that means for example a let me get one two three four and i give you another matrix for example minus one three seven minus eight okay so these are two matrices and i ask you to add them or define for me how to add them naturally yes roko Yeah, it seems the most natural way, yes? So it means that this is a good definition to add two matrices, as simple as that. Just add the corresponding entries. So I will take the one on the first row and first column, first row, first column, add them together so it becomes zero. And I will do the same thing for the other one, the other one, and the other one, yes? This is a good way probably to define addition. But one thing is important, this is some kind of abuse of notation, yes? Because this sum that I put, if I, if I want to write it more properly, so you are saying me that to define addition of two matrices, you write this. Yes, but what I want you to understand, I am using the same symbol of addition here and all these four places, but they are quite different. Yes, because this operation is an addition between two blocks of numbers, but this is just the primary school addition. So I would call it the common addition, but this is the addition that I am defining for you. So I am defining the addition of these new objects based on the addition of numbers that we have already learned. So in principle, I should use another symbol for this. But because there is no matter of confusion, I will use the same symbol here. Okay? So, but you understand, whenever you see this, and then you have two matrices on the sides, then this refers to matrix addition. But if you have that symbol again, but you have only two numbers on sides, then it refers to just the common addition. And these things that I am talking about becomes very important in more advanced mathematics, yes? So I'm just paying attention. But then one problem comes up, yes? What happens if I have different dimensions? So if I have this matrix two by two, but this matrix, instead of being two by two, let us have it two by three, for example. Let me add one column to it, for example, square root of two and seven. Then what do you think will happen, yes? No, so no, I keep this two by two, but I change this one, and I still ask you, add these two matrices. What do you think would be a natural way to do it, yes? Uh, yeah, that's one way. You, what do you say? Yeah, basically the same thing, just add the existing entries and the, okay. from A, add the existing entries to B, and then mm -hmm. well, the other ones just keep them as they Okay, which, uh, which existing entries? So one, two, three, four, so one plus minus one, uh, two plus three, three plus seven. No, what happens with this? I mean, what, what do you... Uh, what? Plus zero, technically, I guess. Okay, so what you are saying, as what Sara said, you are saying that adding a bunch of zeros there. But this is not the case that mathematician has chosen. They say that if this happens, life is easier. Say it's not defined. Okay? So, yeah, that's the way. I mean, that, that is, might be that's one way. I'm not criticizing that. But the standard matrix theory says that if you have these two matrices, say it is undefined. Yes? And that's what I'm saying, that if you, if, you def if you say that whenever you see this add bunch of zeros and do the same thing again, that is not this addition. That brings a not new operation. And then it happens that if that new operation is useful for something, we continue studying its properties. If not, we just ignore it. But I'm teaching the standard matrix theory, which in that case tells you that A plus B is undefined. I just want you to understand the mentality behind mathematics. What mathematics care is just self-consistencies, yes? Uh, that is very important in mathematics. Okay, now if I want to define it formal. So, 
I have written the formal one in the PDF file, so you really don't need to bother about writing it down unless you write understand better. That's a, a different thing. But let me, if I want to answer this, so if I have a m by n, to be able to add b, for example, p times q, it has m rows, n columns, it has p, Qs, uh, p rows and q columns. If I want to add them, first of all, I need to check if m is equal to p and uh, n is equal to q. If this does not happen, if any one of them is not correct, then you would say that this addition is not defined. If both of them are correct, then you can add them up. But how do you add them? For example, if I have matrix A, let me say A, I, J, M by N. This is the generic form of writing a matrix M by N. And let me take another matrix B, I, J with the same order. And then I ask you, I have a matrix A. I want you to write A plus B. Yes. So then, first of all, what, what is the order of this matrix, do you think? We have some ideas, yes? If I have an M by N matrix, another M by N matrix, if I add them and if I want to follow this definition of addition, it will generate exactly the same dimension matrix, yes? So it will give me an M by N matrix again. And then I can ask Cij means the entry sitting on the ith row and jth column is equal to what? Can you tell me? Yeah? Yes, exactly. So that's the definition, mathematical way of defining, yes? So you say that every entry on the, in the sum is equal to the entry, the corresponding entry from A, the corresponding entry from B added. That's the definition of Or I, I, I can say that, for example, uh, if I have two matrices, <coughs> this is another way of writing. If I ask you, what is the i jth entry of that? Be careful, A and B are matrices, A plus B is a matrix, but when you see this subscript here, it means this is just one single number, and that is the number sitting on the i throw jth column of this sum. If I ask you what is this, you will tell me that I will go in A, find that entry, I will go and find that entry in B as well, and then add these two numbers. Now let me ask you, do you differentiate between this symbol here and that symbol there? Yes or no? Which one is the common addition? The one on the right, because this is the addition between two numbers. A is a matrix, but A sub i j is a number. That's also a number. I am using addition, so that's addition between numbers. But here the addition is between two matrices. So this addition is the addition that we just defined. That addition is the addition that you learn in the primers. Okay? And then, uh, by the way, what do you think would be a good definition for difference? If I want to find the difference of two matrices, the same thing, but instead of adding, I subtract, yes? So it becomes A sub IJ, then it becomes A IJ minus B sub IJ. Okay. Uh, so let me just go to the notes. So here I have to change it. Okay, so here let A be... A and B. Uh, it's very important, by the way, I don't know how many of you respect reading the notes. First of all, please do that because it will teach you how to read mathematics. And secondly, read it very uh, actively so that if you see any misprints or any grammatical error, I would appreciate, please inform me about that so that I can update it. So read it uh, uh, objectively, okay? So let A, B be matrices of the same size. Uh, first of all, my question is that same size is correct or same sizes? Same size. Yeah, that's a little bit strange, it's silly English for me. Okay, the sum A plus B is defined to be the matrix of the same size obtained by adding entries of A to the corresponding entries of B. The difference A minus B is defined to be the matrix of the same size obtained by subtracting the entries of B from the corresponding entries of A, yes? Because by the way, when you write A minus B, this is subtraction of B from A, yes? Not, you read it A minus B, but if you want to write it subtraction, this is the subtraction of B from A, yes? 
And this I have defined. And then I told you that this semicolon equal to means defined to be. So there is no Y there. I'm just defining this. Okay. Yeah. Is that clear? Okay. And then these are the examples. So I really don't need to write them down because it is clear. So if I want to add these two matrices to what I have done, I have two by two matrices. I am adding them. I have added the corresponding entries. Yes. And I got a two by two matrix at the end. So this is very, very simple. And you see, I have given an example here. Is it possible to add these two matrices? Again, yes. This is a, what is the name of this matrix? Just review this type of matrices, which includes only one row. Yes. Row matrix. So I am adding two row matrices of the same order. So if I want to add them, I follow the same rule. I, I take minus three and one and add them here. And I add two, I take two and two and add them here, one and one and add them here. And I did, at the end, I get something like that. And I have written the difference between these two matrices. What are they called? Yes. Column, Column matrices. So if you want to subtract them, you follow the same rule. And then you see that I have done the same thing here. Yes. Is that clear? It's very, very simple. And then consider the following matrices, A plus B and A minus B are not defined for this case because the first one is two by two, the other one is two by three, the dimensions are not the same, so they are not be able to, add, to be added or subtracted. Yes? And then I want you to complete this in your head. So complete the following statements. The sum and the difference of two upper triangular matrices are, what type of matrix will it give you? If you have two, for example, first consider upper triangular matrix. By the way, let us just refresh your memory. What was upper triangular matrix? Yes. Uh, so it is first of all a square matrix, upper triangular. Okay, so what is, what is the definition? Anyone else? I want you to have these things in your head, yes? Don't refer to your notes. <laughs> yes, what is your name? Ella, yes? All zeros are, all entries are zero below the diagonal. Yes, so it means that when you say upper triangular, everything below the main diagonal should be zero. I don't care about what is happening on the diagonal and what is happening above the diagonal. So below it should be zero. Okay, now if I have these, I have two of these matrices and then I, of the same order, of course, and then I add them, what do you expect to get? Yes? of the same type, yes? Because these, if I have another matrix of this type, with the same order, yes? When I add them, I don't know what is happening here, here, but I know that this is a bunch of zeros which will be added to that bunch of zeros, it will give me a bunch of zeros. So if I have two upper triangular matrices and if I add them or subtract them, I will get a matrix of the same type at the end, yes? And this is clear if I have it for other ones. So if I go here, uh, okay, so the sum and difference of two upper triangular matrices are upper triangular, the sum and difference of two lower triangular matrices are lower triangular, and the sum and difference of two diagonal matrices are diagonal, yes? This is also a definition, probably I shouldn't show you first, but what is your intuition? If I ask you what is the negative of a matrix, you, I want you to define it for me. So how do you define it naturally, yes? negative of that interest. That's the correct definition, yes? So what you see is completely correct. So opposite of a matrix, if I have an M by N matrix, the opposite of A is usually again denoted by minus A, yes? And it is defined to be this matrix. So I just want you to understand by reading this sentence, okay, you should get that what uh, actually Gustav described. Do you get that? So you see that what is happening, A is written in a mathematical symbol, in a form, and I am saying that the opposite of A is denoted by that and is defined in this way. Do you get the same feeling that Gustav said by just reading this then? That's okay. And then this is very simple. If I give you a matrix and if I ask you what is the opposite, what I have done, I have changed the signs of each one of these entries to its opposite. And that's called the opposite of a matrix. And then nothing is very surprising here. So what you expect, now this turns out to be a theorem, properties of matrix addition. So this is, of course, you now see it is a theorem, so you can rely on it. But do you agree that the same properties of addition of numbers will also be followed exactly in matrix addition? Because we just defined everything in terms of the addition of numbers. And it seems that every property that addition of numbers have 
it has, this should also share, yes? For example, you know that the, the, the sum is commutative. If I have two numbers, it doesn't matter if I add the first number to the second or the other way around. And if I have two matrices of the same order, so it doesn't matter if I add A to B or B to A. Do you agree with that? Yes? Okay, so that is called commutative. I really want you to learn the words as well. Okay. And then what is the meaning of this? Can, can anyone describe it for me? When it, we, we say it is associative, yes. So what does it mean? Yes, let me just go back. Yes, what does it mean? Yeah, so for, uh, let us not talk about the times for the time being. So what you are saying is that if I have three matrices and I want to add them to be, f it might be ambiguous, yes? But if it is associative, it is not ambiguous if I write it like that. For example, if I write in the exam, do this, this is ambiguous. I cannot ask you what is the answer to this. Because depending on how you interpret, how you prioritize these operations, you get a different answer. And that is the reason, because a division is not associative. So when division is not associative, priority of the operation becomes important. So you see, if you interpret this as this, you can interpret this as this. Yes? If you interpret it in this way, let me write it as 2 thirds, because 2 divided by 3 is this, and then divided by 5, if I divide that, it becomes 2 over 15. But if I want to do this, you have to be patient, keep 2 for the time being, divide 3 by 5, which is 3 over 5, and then it becomes 10 over 3. And then you see that the answers are not the same. So if an operation is not associative, it is sensitive to how you group them. Okay, and that, that is a little, bit big of a little bit of trouble, so you have to be careful about how you group them. But the, if I have an operation which is associative, then something like this is not ambiguous because, for example, for numbers 2 plus 3 plus 5, if I give you this in the exam, everyone should get the answer the same regardless of how you prioritize these operations. But if you, I give you this, if you prioritize it in this way, you will get this answer. If you prioritize it in this way, you will get this answer. So division is not associative because it is sensitive how to group them, how to prioritize them. But addition is sensitive, if I, is, is associative. If I give you this, you might interpret it in that way, depending to your taste or simplicity of doing things. And then you will get 5 plus 5, which is 10. You might also pr prioritize it in that way. Of course, the intermediate step will be different because now you have 2 plus 8, but the final result is the same. So working with the associative operations are usually easier for us because I am not very observant to see how I am grouping them. Okay, but be careful. Is this... Uh, uh, is this... 2, for example, plus 3 plus 5, uh, let me just write it like this, and then write it like that. Yes? Uh, which one of these properties I need for, of course, you, you know that this answer is, this, this equality is true, it is not false, it is completely true, but I want you to understand if I ask you, is it associativity or not, what is this? Is it only associativity that allows me to write this equality or I need more uh, properties here? Yes, Alexander? Commutativity as well. So in order to be able to write such a thing, it is not just associativity. Yes, because associativity tells you that if you have A plus B plus C, it doesn't matter if you put the pair of brackets in the first or you put the pair of brackets on the second pair, yes? But the order that you read does not change. You read it A, B, C, you read it A, B, C, you read it A, B, C. So it, this is associativity, okay? But here, I read it 2, 3, 5, I read it 2, 5, 3, the order has changed. So it means associativity on its own is not enough to conclude this equality. 
Yes? But this equality is true because addition is also commutative. So if you want to do that, what we do? So I don't know, how do you do that? Let us, by the way, this is good to understand if you want to understand things a little bit deeper. So I use associativity. Associativity let me take this pair of brackets and put them around here. Yes? So this means that I, 2 plus 3 plus 5. Yes? Commutativity allows me to interchange these two. So you see this becomes 2 plus 5 plus 3. So this is associativity. Uh, yes, this is commutativity. But again, associativity allows me to do what? Oh, I did. Did I make a mistake or not? No, that's correct. Associativity allows me to take the pair of brackets and put them around here. So this becomes 2 plus 5 plus 3. And that is again associativity. So in order to prove, you might say this is a little bit exaggerating things. No, but if you want to understand things deeper, this is important. Uh, if I ask you how, which properties of addition are used here to be able to see that this is equal to this, two properties, associativity and commutativity. Associativity two times, commutativity one time. Yes, so both of them is needed to see this very innocent truth here. So sometimes the reason that I'm talking about that, this will not happen this session, but next session that I'm talking about matrix multiplication, you will see that we will lose one of these properties. And interestingly, we will keep associativity. So we lose commutativity in that way of defining matrix multiplication. And the miracle is that the definition is in a way that is still we have associativity. So in the future, we will see that if I have two matrices, if I multiply them, order matters. There is no guarantee that A times B becomes equal to B times A. But the definition is a little bit more complicated than that. And then Surprisingly, that definition is very well suited that this is still the case. Yes? So we will see that that comes next time. So the product of matrices in general is not commutative, but it is still associative. And then this brings a lot of confusion for the students who are seeing this for the first time because you have developed your math knowledge based on these commutativities and associativities taken for granted, then you might face some problems, okay? That is, of course, this will uh, actually be uh, remedied very, very soon. Okay, so that is the idea I want you to understand, so that these are not just names and words. You need to remember them, of course, and then try to be able to, uh, be able to describe it in your own words. Okay. Uh, Okay, so, and then I have here that a zero is the zero matrix of the same size. So, and this is probably clear for you. If I add a matrix to the zero matrix, it will give me the matrix back. And by the way, I haven't written this down, probably I will fix it. Zero is called the additive identity. Okay, the zero matrix is called additive identity. These words are coming from a branch of mathematics called group theory, yes, but these are standard. So when I say additive identity, it means that when I add it to a matrix, it does not change the matrix, okay? And then you know that if I give you a matrix and you add it to its opposite, it will give you the zero matrix. And the opposite sometimes is also called additive inverse. So be careful about because inverse of one usually, inverse of two you usually think as one over two. But this is additive inverse. Or opposite, of course. Okay. Uh, this is very, very important, but of course very simple for you for the time being. So. A, B, C, B matrices of the same size such that A plus B is equal to A plus C. If you want to, you can conclude that B is equal to C. Yes? Uh, again, don't take these things for granted. Yes, I will describe it a little bit for you see here on the board. So what we want to show is that if A plus B is equal to A plus C, 
I can, this is called additive cancellation. So this is addition and A is in common on both sides. I can cancel it out and conclude that B is equal to C. Of course, if they are matrices of the same size. Yes? Okay. You might say that, okay, this is very trivial. I, it's not trivial, but it is very obvious to immediately realize. Because, for example, later we will see that this will not work in multiplication. For example, in numbers, if I give you A plus B is equal to uh, A plus C, if A, B, and C are numbers, of course you can immediately realize that B is equal to C. Yes? And I want to do it more properly here. But in numbers, if I give you A times B is equal to A times C, and I guarantee you that A is not equal to zero, can you tell me what can you conclude? Yes? B is equal to C. Okay? But the interesting thing is that in matrix theory, this is not correct in general. So if I give you matrices that A times B is equal to A times C, and I also give you that this matrix is not the zero matrix, but if you naively conclude that, okay, then B has to be equal to C, you see that in general this is not true. So that's what I'm saying, that the algebra of matrices become different after we studied multiplication. But before that, more or less everything is the same. Okay, but let me try to prove this. But when I say I, I want to prove it, you cannot say that I move A to the other side, it becomes minus A. Be careful. Why? You can, but not at this stage. Because what you did f was for numbers. There is no guarantee that the same property still holds for matrices. If it holds, you have to show it. So if you want to show it, you would say that, okay, what I do, you are telling me that this matrix is equal to that matrix, so I can understand that if I add minus A to the left-hand side, it becomes equal to if I add minus A to the right-hand side. Yes? Then you will tell me that matrix addition is associative, so instead of having the pair of brackets here, I can put them here. And then instead of having pair of brackets here, there, so I am using associativity, yes? Uh, here it becomes minus A plus A plus C, and then we just learned that this addition is the zero matrix. And then, of course, we know that zero matrix added by that, by that theorem that I just mentioned, B plus zero is B, and C plus C, uh, zero is C. Now, from now on, if you want to, you can move it to the other side and make it negative. Okay, so we showed that this is, in principle, working. So this is something very trivial. Not very trivial, I mean, very obvious. But, yeah, be patient a little bit this session. It will come to more interesting things later. Uh, okay, so, and then I just, I want to skip the proof for this one. So this guarantees you that if you have an unknown matrix, A plus an unknown matrix equals to B, if you want to find, if you want to find your unknown matrix, you can just simply move it to the other side. But as an exercise, I want you to write the rigorous proof of that. I mean, rigorous proof is mean something like this. I want you to start using the properties. Uh, but from now on, don't need to prove it. For example, if I give you this matrix, it, this is an equation, by the way. The unknown is not a number. The unknown is a matrix, and I want to find it. So what I'm supposed to do? I move this matrix to the other side, but I have to change the sign, and then subtract it. It's very simple, so if you don't mind, let me just skip that. But it is important to know which operations you're allowed to do and which operations you're not allowed to do. This one, I want to have a proof for that, for the one of the signs, for example, or both of them. This tells you that, by the way, you should be able, to, if you have a good idea, you should be able to guess the right-hand side yourself. If I give you two matrices of the same order, by the way, do you remember what was the word trace? What is the meaning of trace? Yes, sir. The sum of? No, the sum of all the entries, you mean? No. Yes? 
the same the sum of the main diagonals yes so so this is the word trace i haven't given you an example why the trace is important i will be able to provide one for you in the future but that's good to know about it okay so trace of a matrix so if a is an n by n matrix because by the way trace is only defined when you have a square matrix otherwise the trace is meaningless so if i ask you what is the trace of a what do you say you would say it is a sigma of the entries of A, which are sitting on the main diagonal. But on the main diagonal, what is the relation between the uh, row index and the column index? If you are on the main diagonal, they are the same. So I do not write IJ, I would write II, because both of them are the same. And I will run I from the first entry to the last entry. So that was the definition of the trace. So if I ask you what the trace is, the trace is at the sum of, the all, of all entries on the main diagonal. Now imagine that. If you add two matrices and then take the trace, what is, this, what is the difference? Can you take the traces first and then add? Imagine it in your head first, because it is intuitively easy to, to guess. So this tells me that I give you two matrices, you add them first, it becomes a new matrix, and then read the trace of the new matrix. It becomes a number at the end. Register that number somewhere. On the other side, you calculate the trace of one of them, you get a number. You calculate the trace of the other one, you get a number, you add the numbers, you get another number, register it somewhere else. What is the relation between these two numbers intuitively? They are the same. Can you feel it? Okay, but of course feeling is not proof, but I have to prove it. So I want to show that yes, this is not a coincidence. These two numbers are always the same. But let me actually draw your attention to some point. Which one of these operations is a normal addition? Which one? The second one, yes? Because this one is the addition between two matrices. But this addition is between two. These are numbers. Tr a is a matrix, but trace of A is a number. That's also a number. So here I am adding two numbers. But here I am adding two matrices, OK? So it is just connecting the addition of a matrix to addition of numbers. So how can I prove that? So I will start from the left-hand side, which is trace of A plus B. So let me just, uh, first of all, if I want to write a proper proof, so let me just write all the details. So I would say that let A and B be matrices, square matrices of order N. By the way, I want to also teach a little bit of how writing mathematics. This sentence is necessary in the proof. I will tell you why. Or something similar. I'm not saying that follow exactly my English words, but you need to say something about this. Why is that? Because I want to write trace of A plus B. Okay, can you help me to write the trace of A plus B? It is a sum, so it is a sigma. Yes? And then I should have a counter for my sigma, so let us choose it a name. And then it goes from 1 to where? Where? OK, say something. You are frozen, yes. What should I write? Sigma i goes from 1 to n. So you see that now that sentence is necessary. Because if you do not write that sentence and just write n, the person who is reading your text is always thinking what n is. So this is extremely important. Of course, when we want to do these th things in hurry, we really don't need to write proper proof. But if you really want to learn to write proper proofs, whenever you use a symbol, you have already you have to already uh, introduce it to the reader. Okay. So because I want to use n, n was not in the problem from the beginning. The only letters involved were a and b. So I don't need to talk about them because this is already given in the problem. But when I want to write an n here, so I have to introduce n is. And I don't need to introduce i because i is a dummy variable. You could choose it k, you could choose it whatever you want to. But this is necessary. You cannot just say i from 1 to n. Okay? And then what should I write here? It is the, uh, this is a plus b, whatever this guy is, but i i. So I just want you to make sure that you understand. Do you understand what's going on? 
Okay, this is the way that I write it. But forget about this sum. We learned how to write this today. What should I write instead of a plus b i i? What can I write? I want to find the i i -th entry of a plus b. According to what we learned today, I go for find the same entry on a, and then I go and find the same entry on b, and then add them. Yes? And then I have this sigma, so I copy and paste it. But of course, this is not very good. I need to put another pair of brackets to show that everything is in front of the sigma. Now. Okay? But then I have another property of sigmas, yes? Do you remember we talked about that? If I have a sigma and then I have a addition here so that all of them depend on the counter, I can decompose the sigma to two sigmas. So I can write sigma of a i i, i goes from 1 to n plus sigma i goes from 1 to n b i i. Yes? Now can you tell me what is this? What is another name for this guy? This is entries on the i-th row and i-th column for matrix A added from the first entry to the last entry. So what is this? Yeah? Trace. It's trace of A. And similarly this is trace of B. So this is trace of A plus this is trace of B. Yes? So we were able to show that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. And I think you will agree with me, it doesn't matter if I change the sign from addition to subtraction all the way around, yes? But this also works. Okay. So you can see a little bit here a scalar product. So I want to talk about that because so, so, uh, when we were talking with numbers, we had only one mathematical creature and that, were, that was numbers, yes? But now we have numbers on the one hand and then we have matrices on the other hand. We can in principle think about operations between these two realms of mathematics, numbers and blocks of numbers, yes? For example, I don't think there is a good hope if I want to add a... So if I give you 2 plus... One, two, three, five. What do you think is a good thing to do? Is it a plausible question to ask add two to this matrix? It's not, because if you remember, a, ma a number itself was a one by one matrix. And today we just learned that if the dimensions are different, the definition, uh, the addition is not defined. So it is not possible probably, or hard at least, to make it consistent to work with everything. So this is not defined. We don't talk about adding a number to a matrix. But we can simply talk about multiplying a number by a matrix, and that is called a scalar product, yes? So, I give you a real number, any number that you like, and I give you any matrix, M by N, whatever you like, A, I, J, yes, oops, you need to remind me sometimes. Okay, so, uh, oh, that was very unfortunate, so I don't, the, the proof is not recorded probably. <laughs> Yeah, please remind me if you see something is going on. Yeah, it's, I have to concentrate on a lot of things. Anyway, uh, so now if I give you A and if I give you R and I tell you multiply R by A, this way of writing, you don't, this is common. We don't put any operation, any symbols for this. This is called scalar multiplication because another name for numbers is, uh, is scalars. So we, a number sometimes is called a scalar. Okay? So uh, I have a number, I have a matrix, I multiply this number by this matrix according to this definition. This tells you that, by the way, that is also very natural. What do you think I will define it? How do you think I will define it? Now, naturally, I'm just saying that there is nothing... You understand, but if you were a mathematician and I give you a number and I give you a matrix and I ask you, okay, how to define to multiply? How is good to define it? What do you think? Yes? Every entry. Yes, that's probably the most. So that's, if I want to translate what you said, 
yes it's R times all entries yes and it will of course give you another M by N matrix so this operation is called scalar multiplication and the result is the scalar product and this is common we put the number on the left the matrix on the right so you see 2a but I haven't seen a2 yes now this is common that you put the number on the left yes Yes, but that is quite advanced, we don't talk about that. Now, the, the exponent here, yes, we will talk, but not all type of exponent. I thought that you want to raise a number to a matrix. Yeah, so that's also sometimes possible, okay? But, uh, but for the time being, no. Uh, so again, an operation is going on. This operation, you see I am not using any symbol here. I'm not using any symbol between R and AIJ, but this product is just primary school product because that's product between numbers, but this is what I just defined. Okay. So there are some properties before looking at the PDF, let us try to discover. And I want you to have them in your memory so that you know you, you can use them. Let us talk a little bit here. So if I give you any matrix A and I ask you to multiply 1 to that matrix, what do you think I will get by this definition? Yes? The same matrix. Yes? Is it clear? So I multiply 1 by the matrix, it will give me the same matrix. But you have to think about it. Don't take it for granted. So don't say that, okay, one times any number is the same number. Yes, so then one times any matrix is the same matrix. They are related, but they are not the same thing. They are not the same statement in mathematics. So it means that it needs thinking, at least even one for one second, to understand that this is also working. Another thing is that if I have the zero number and I multiply it by a matrix, so what do I get? The zero, uh, the zero matrix of the same order. So, so if that is M by N, I get the zero matrix again M by N, yes? On the other hand, if I have a number and I multiply it by the zero matrix M by N, what do I get? I get the zero matrix of the same order. Of course, all of them to be honest, you have to think one second for why all of them are correct. But that's very, very trivial. Okay, so let us now go to more interesting ones. And by the way, what happens if I multiply minus a, minus 1 by a? It becomes opposite. It becomes negative a. But be careful, all of them are theorems. So you have to think why they are true. When, but the proofs are easy. The, the difference with having an axiom doesn't need proof and the ones that are the proofs are easy yes the proofs are easy it means that okay they deserve a proof the proof is easy fortunately okay so these are very trivial the other ones also very trivial i think so what happens if i have two matrices of the same order i add them okay and then i multiply it by a number okay can i distribute this somehow So my question is that, because the natural way of thinking, if it is going to work like uh, the polynomials and things like that, we used to multiply this inside. Still, do you think we can do the same thing for matrices or not? Yes. You, just intuitively. It seems to be true, yes? Okay, we'll come back to discuss about this. What happens if I have two numbers? So here R is a real number. But what happens if I have two real numbers and then I add them and then I multiply it by a matrix? What do you think will happen? Instead of adding the numbers first and then multiplying by the matrix, can I multiply the first number by the matrix, multiply the second number by the matrix and then add the matrices? Do you think I will get the same matrix back intuitively? Yes, it seems to be true, okay? But let me, by the way, another one is that R and S are in R. R, S, A. Yes? 
I give you two numbers, you multiply them first, it becomes a new number, and then you take that number and multiply it to this matrix. Can I do this multiplication step by step, meaning that, can I multiply the matrix by S first, and whatever I get, I multiply R to the new matrix. Do you think I will get the same thing back? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. What is this called? Is it called associativity? I'm taking the pair of brackets from here and put them there. Can I say this is associative? The answer is no. Associativity is for the same operation. There are two operations involved here. Can you describe them for me? This is why I'm, I want you to understand these things. There are two operations involved here. What are the operations? Yes? No, two different operations. Two different operations means two different operations, yes. So you might say there are two multiplications going on. Okay. But there are two different multiplications going on. This is multiplication between numbers. This is multiplication that we just defined. So it is not associative. It looks like being associative, but I cannot say that so, because if I, I cannot ask, is a scalar multiplication associative? Why is that? Because it is between two different mathematical creatures. It is between one number and one matrix. Associativity makes sense if you are within one set of collection of things, objects. Either all of them are matrices or all of them are numbers or whatever, yes? This, it looks like associativity, it's not associative. To be honest, if I want to write it properly, so let me just, if I have a number, so let me put a circle around that. So in principle, I should have another symbol for a scalar multiplication. But because it becomes a very messy and there is no matter of confusion, people actually immediately suppress that. Okay? So if I want to write that operation, so I would write R dot S, this times A, yes? This is equal to what? S, A, or this. So if I want to write this very strictly, I have to write it like that. Because this operation between R and S is the normal multiplication. This operation is something new we just defined. So this is the real way of looking at this. But it is very messy and there is no matter of confusion people do not write these things. Yes? So let me just try to understand this one as well. So if I want to understand that, here R plus S is the normal addition. And then it is supposed to be multiplied by a matrix. So in principle you should do it like that. You should write it like this. But what is here? It should be R dot like this A and then S dot like that and then another addition. Yes? So this is, in reality, if you want to be very strict and write everything down, this is the way that you have to write. Yes? Because here you see, I didn't change this one. I am using this for normal multiplication. I am using this for uh, normal addition. I am using this for this new multiplication that I define. I am using this for addition of two matrices. And then this is the way that you have to look it up. Okay, can you write this down for me using this odd notation as well? Yes? What is that? That is a scalar multiplication. This is a scalar multiplication, yes. yes. Uh, here I have, because I haven't talked about multiplying two matrices, so I, I'm reserving this symbol for that. I mean that you have, to, you have to have in principle different symbols for different operations, yes? Uh, but because it becomes very messy and very time-consuming and the risk of confusion is very low if you understand what you are doing, so people try to suppress this. But I want, I want you to understand in reality, if I want to write something this, I have to write it like that. Okay? Okay, can you tell me how should I write this in a messy way? Okay, this is R. What type of operation I have to put here? Circled one or without circle? circled one because this is number and that's a matrix so I have to write it like this and this one I have to circle around that yes and then on the right hand side I have to write what or circled multiplication a 
or circled multiplication B and then circled addition here. Okay, so that is the way that you need to interpret that because they are different. Uh, okay, so all of them are also true, but be careful. This is not associativity. You see, this is not associativity because how many type of multiplications are involved? Two. Associativity makes sense only if you have one type of operation. Yes? This is not associativity. It is similar somehow, but it is not associativity. Uh, again, this is not distributivity because distributivity is what... Yes, I can call that distributivity because distributivity is... No, again, that's not distributivity because distributivity is something like this. These should come from the same collection. All of them are numbers. But here I have two, I have two matrices and I have one number in. Okay. So from now on, I want you to understand that you can use all of them. But if I want to prove it rigorously, one of them, I want you to learn that one as well. And then I want you to understand how these relations, I told you this is not associativity, but it is connected to associativity property of numbers. If the numbers were not enjoying associativity, this is not correct. We will see. Let us prove that one using, uh, you, you can help me to prove that. Okay, so if I want to prove this, let me just prove it rigorously. So proof for that part. Okay. Okay, if you don't mind, let me be a little bit pedantic here now and then try to use this symbol, okay? So proof of this one, I would say that let A be a square matrix. No, not square, because this is by the way. Let be an M by N matrix. By the way, uh, don't get this wrong. This is valid for all type of matrices. You see, I'm just writing M by N. But they should be of the same order, of course. Otherwise, addition is not defined. So let A be an M by N matrix. And let, if you want to be very careful, and let I be somewhere between 1 and uh, M and j be an index between 1 and n. Of course, natural. i and j are natural numbers. Yes? I want to show this is correct. To, in order to show that these two matrices are the same, I have to show that the dimensions are the same. I have to show the corresponding entries. Oh, sorry. I have to show that the uh, dimensions are the same. I have to show that the corresponding entries are the same. Of course, the, dom uh, the orders are the same because multiplying a matrix by a number will not change the order. So the order of the matrix on the left and the order of the matrix on the right are the same. What I need to go to prove, I need to prove this. R dot S, let me be a little bit clear in this case. I, I take an ijth entry of the matrix on the left and I want to convince you that that entry is equal to the corresponding entry of the matrix on the right. Yes? This I want you to be able to write. Can you help me? How should I write this? So this is very, very easy, but math, if you want to write things mathematically rigorous, it seem, looks a little bit complicated if you don't know how to read it, but by practice you will learn. Okay, can you tell me what to do? Okay, to, um, to understand that, you need to tell me what to do here. Can you tell me if I want to write this, what do you write? The ijth entry of number R multiplied by matrix A. What do you do? You go and take the ijth entry of your matrix and whatever it is, you multiply it by the number. Yes? That is the way. Do you understand this symbol? These are just symbols. Do you, I want you to understand everything is very, very simple. But if you want to use the symbols in a proper way, you need to understand. Everyone understand that? Yes? Okay, so can you tell me what can I do here now? I will take my number, r dot s, 
Okay, this dot is the normal dot. And then I will take the entry of this matrix A, I, J. And then what should I put here? Dot or circle dot? Dot. Yes? Is that understandable? Okay, now let me ask you, I want you to see how much you understand. I take the pair of brackets around from here and put it here. Okay? Can I do that? Yes or no first? Yes. And what is the name of that property you are using? Associativity. Here it is associativity. Why? Because R, S are numbers. A is a matrix, but A sub I, J is a number. So that is a product between all numbers, and then that's just associativity. So it doesn't matter if I group these together or I group these together. So you see, I told you that this is not called associativity, but it is related to the associativity property of numbers. Yes? Otherwise, this is step I cannot go. Okay, but now what can I write? Instead of this, I can write S dot A and then write I, J. Do you agree? This one, I am writing for this. Do you agree with that? And then I have R dot again. But what can I write here? I can write R cross circle, I mean circle dot and then I have A and then the total thing I, J. <laughs> I don't know, might be you are, I, I, you are very confused. I really want you to go and study this a little bit. I am making very abstract mathematics here. It is nothing, but this is also one a skill you have to learn if you want to write mathematical proofs. So this is why, if, let me tell you what is happening. What is happening is that if I want to multiply 2 by 3, and then I have to multiply it by a matrix 1, 2, 3, 5, yes. This tells you that instead of writing 6 and multiplying it in, you can first multiply 3 in and then multiply 1 in. As simple as that. But unfortunately, when you write the regular proof, it seems horrible. And then you need to improve this skill if you want to read texts to be able to understand the core idea by reading the lines. Yes, uh, so every now and then I will give you some kind of these things, but f you don't need to worry about, I will not ask these quest type of questions, but I am talking about these to understand these things because this will be important. Is that clear? So at least you know it is not associativity, but it is connected to the associativity of uh, real numbers. Okay, so let us see how we can proceed. I go here, hopefully here, okay. Uh, so here you see I have examples, I have given you, so this type of calculations I need and the questions I ask are at the end. So I give you a matrix and I multi ask you multiply square root of 3 for example by A, it means that go to this matrix multiply square root of 3 by all these entries and then you get this matrix, yes? Okay, so uh, I want to wait for you because I want you to get this feeling that this is extremely simple. I want to wait for you for five minutes, not more, so that you can solve these two problems for me. Okay, extremely simple, but I want you to uh, be able to do it, okay? Uh, and then, by the way, this in example 1.54, this I, I haven't talked about the I, but this is reserved. What is I here? In matrix theory, I, if this is not defined in the problem itself, I refers to? No, no, I, the capital I. Yes? The identity. the identity matrix, which is? It's a diagonal matrix with all entries 1, 1, 1 at the end. So that is always reserved. That's why I haven't defined that. Yes? In principle, I should define every symbol I am using. You see, I have done that without mentioning anything about I. And of course, how many I's are there? How many identity matrices are there? Infinitely many, but which one do you think this I is referring to in this problem? Yes? Two by two, because all matrices involved are two by two, so the left-hand side is a two by two matrix, the right-hand side has to be also a two by two. 
this is why I didn't bother even to mention the order. Okay, so if you don't mind, just wait a little bit so that I pause. Okay, could you solve the problems? Yes? Not yet? Okay, so I wait a little bit more. Okay, so let us solve the problem. Hopefully it is actually manageable, even if you are a little bit lost in calculations, but that is very simple. If I want to answer the first question mark, so it is four, it is 3a minus 4b. So it, if, let me write it properly, 3 times a, 1, 2, 3, minus 4, and then minus 4 times uh, minus 3, 2, 1, 0. By the way, one thing that I want to mention, it is, this is not ambiguous, yes, because even though I have this operation, let me just emphasize on dot here. Again, the same op, uh, priority of operations is also applicable here. So if you see subtraction and multiplication, you need to do the multiplications first. And by the way, this is not very strange. You might think that is a rule, but no. When, because when I ask you to do a subtraction, I cannot ask you to do the subtraction unless I give you the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So I am asking you to do the subtraction so this means that you have to have this, you have to have this be or to, in order to be able to do the subtraction. So you understand that m multiplication has priority over subtraction, yes? Otherwise, how can I do that? But of course, you can define it different ways. But I mean, this is one way to understand that. So what I say, I will multiply 3 in, so it becomes 3, 6, 9, minus 12. Here, I can multiply minus 4 in, then I should write positive sign, but I will prefer to keep minus sign here and just multiply 4 in as the definition, yes? Because minus 12, 8, 4, and 0, and then I start subtracting them. So 3 minus minus 12 is 15. 6 minus 8 is minus 2. And then 9 minus 4 is 5. And then minus 12 minus 0 is minus 12. That's the final answer to this problem. So what is important at the end for you, if you're not that very interested in those kinds of rigorous arguments, this is what I need you to be able to do. So that's extremely simple, yes? And here, A, B, and C are given. And as I told you, when I do not describe I in matrix theory, I mean that's an identity matrix. Uh, but as Robert mentioned, because they are 2 by 2, so this identity matrix should be also 2 by 2. So what I do, I would write this alpha A plus beta B plus gamma C is equal to 3 times I. This would imply, instead of A, I put the matrix given 2, 0, and 0, 3 plus beta. Instead of matrix given, 3, 0, 0, 2, and then plus gamma. The matrix given is 0, 3, 0, 0 is equal to 3. Matrix I is the identity 2 by 2 matrix. And you know that this is, you should know that this is of this form. And then I will try to find alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha, beta, and gamma are mentioned to be numbers. So I know this is a scalar multiplication. So this becomes 2 alpha, 0, 0, 3 alpha. I'm just multiplying alpha in. And then I will do the same thing for beta. And I will do the same thing for gamma. On the right hand side, I multiply 3 in. Okay, let me just review words. What is the name of this type of matrices? A scalar matrix. A, ma a diagonal matrix whose entries are the same. That's called a scalar matrix. Okay? Okay, and then I need to have the addition between these three matrices, but we know that matrix addition is associative, so I really don't need to bother collecting them, so I just want to do them in one go. This one, plus this one, plus that one. So it is just 2 alpha plus 3 beta. This one, plus this one, plus this one, which is 3 gamma. This, this, and this added is 0. This one, and that one, and that one. So it is 3 alpha plus 2 beta. Yes, this is supposed to be that matrix, but then we learned how two matrices are defined to be equal. Yes, 
it means they are equal if they are have this if, if they have the same order and they, these are correspondingly equal so this means 2 alpha plus 3 beta should be 3 this means 3 gamma should be 0 this means 0 should be 0 which is of course true and this means 3 alpha plus 2 beta should also be 3 so this from here gamma is found to be 0 and then I have to solve a system of these two equations yes So what is the answer? For example, you can multiply the above one by three, the mid, this one by minus two. So this becomes what? Six alpha minus plus nine beta is nine. And then I multiply this by minus two, minus six alpha minus four beta is minus six. And then I add them and then find beta. So this becomes five beta is equal to three. So beta is equal to three over five. And then I put it somewhere here. Uh, I think alpha also turns out to be the same number, yes? Yes. Yeah, but that is easy. So we were able to find alpha, beta, and gamma so that these, this equality holds, yes? So this type of questions you should be able to answer. You will see some more questions in the exam as well. Okay. And then you, uh, I told you for the exam, uh, you're not allowed to consult your, stu uh, your friends and you're not allowed to use, you're allowed to use your notes. But I don't want you to depend on your notes so heavily because that is useless. At the end, you will not learn anything. Try to send some of these to your uh, memory. Uh, and by the way, every now and then, I might ask you a random question. You should be able to answer that. Then I, otherwise, the whole... Uh, result will be a fail okay so you should be ready okay uh, and that's it okay I think there are I want to finish this one I'm no I know that you might be a little bit tired but just uh, try to see how much is left uh, yeah, I have already talked about these things yeah it's better yeah it's better to wait a little bit okay uh, yeah, I want to talk about them more formally, so let us not rush. But anyway, these examples you can do today. If you want to have something to practice more, I recommend you to solve these problems. And by the way, from now on, below the video, in the descriptions, I will put the link to this one. So whenever you look at the video, you can click and get the final, the final version of the notes. Uh, okay, so for the time being, let me, I will complete this next session, but you can solve all the problems that I have written here by this amount of information that you have right now. I don't think you need any extra piece of information, okay? Um, any questions? Yes? It, they are in the Google Classroom, but as I told you that I will upload this video and below in the description I will always put the link to the latest version, so you can find it in two places. Yes? And uh, when it comes to the uh, homework or like the exam, do you want it, how do you want the answers and Do you want like pictures of the... No, sometimes in this case I will give you multiple choice questions. Okay, so the first test will only be multiple choice. Yes. Yeah, because these are not very, uh, very uh, deep. Uh, they are deep, but they are not hard. So I. Yeah, because I uh, yeah not for this one. I couldn't make. Yeah, usually, I have this appetite to make things a little bit harder when it comes to problems. Yeah, but you cannot make them so hard at this level. Yes, that I will every now and then I will ask you to answer in full detail a question, but so not here. So then I really recommend you to learn LaTeX to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I figure that's the best way to because it's not very practical to just take pictures of, uh, of our... Yes, of course. Very but of course it takes a little bit of time uh, to learn LaTeX because LaTeX is a coding system. So you might, uh, if you want to type something very trivial, but you have some bugs in the code and then you have to try to solve that. 
That's what I'm saying. If you want to go to technical university and if you have enough time without the stress, try to learn it and to be, improve your skills so that in the future it will be easier for you. For me, it is even not possible to think about typing in something in Word or something. It's much easier for me to do it in date. No, no, no. It, they have templates for you and then you can actually in some sites Exactly. So that overleaf.com that I introduced, I don't know if you have an account there, it's for free if you don't want to do very fancy things there. And there are very, very nice ready-made templates for whatever you want to do. If you want to write a thesis, if you want to write a book, an article, or whatever you want to. Yeah, yeah. Last year that I had the students, so I had this overleaf, so, and then whenever they typed, they could share it. So I was able to see and then correct it whenever I have time. And then and whenever the correction is finished, the students will see what's happening there. So that's why I think it was useful. And e everyone learned. I had four students. They really learned how to use LaTeX. And probably that was the best thing that they learned in Gymnasium or be able to work with LaTeX. Yes? In that case, you need to write in a handwriting, but there are, of course, I always care about beauty and organize things. So there are some applications you can just take your, I think in uh, near, uh, close, in this recent iPhones, you can have some scanning thing. So I just, if you take it by picture, it is upside down or like this, but if you take it with that application, I think in new iPhones, it's available, but you can also download it. It is like a scan. So it will adjust the angle. If the angle is bad, it will adjust the angle for me. So it becomes a, it, a, as if I have scanned it with machine, you know. So you can find a way. Yeah, try to be artistic a little bit. If you want to do mathematics, you know that in Princeton, when you finalize mathematics, they give you a degree of art, not a degree of art. So that, that is called degree of art. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to be, I don't know, that's up to you. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you very much.